Hi, welcome to Edward Box Guitar Tuition. So I've got another classic album, Inspection, today. Uh, for me, the greatest shred album today, Tony McAlpine's Maximum Security. So originally released in 1987. I couldn't find a release date, so I'm slotting it in in this period. Today's February 25th. But my feeling is this album came out in the summer, around the summer of 87. Um, I still remember getting it on vinyl in my local record shop in Kendall. Um, so, uh, what's this album like? Well, it's on Squawk Records, uh, for starters, not on Shrapnel. Um, so it's still produced by Mike Varney and recorded at Prairie Sun. Uh, but I think Varney or Varney Arts had done a deal with Squawk Records, which was, uh, distributed by Phonogram and was actually run by Peter Mensch, uh, the manager of Cube Prime, famous manager of Def Leppard, ACDC and so forth. Um, but I'm not sure what happened. They did a few albums, uh, uh, they did Vinnie Moore's Time Odyssey, they did Tony McAlpine's Eyes of the World as well, um, but it seemed to go defunct. Um, but anyway, uh, this album got McAlpine more attention, uh, he was featured in Guitar World, he got the front cover of Guitarist magazine uh, in the UK as well. I think deservedly so. Um, it's a really concise album, it's only 39 minutes long. Uh, there's three tracks that are over four minutes, there's Porcelain Doll, Dream State, I think and Key to the City, all the rest uh, are just over three minutes and one's under three minutes, I can't remember. It's really well arranged. Um, if I've got a criticism of the production, it's got really bombastic drums and there's an awful lot of rhythm delay on the guitar, which can work really well on some tracks. But sometimes you'd maybe like the lead guitar kind of brought forward a bit. But it's quite interesting when you just have the drums, bass and rhythm guitar going, which you do on some tracks like the Star of Sacred Wonder, or the start of the vision. You realise how much clarity there is on the rhythm guitar, there's quite a lot of cutting top end. Uh, it's pretty kind of harsh, but in, in a nice way. Um, and it's got a good attack. So, um, what does it open with Autumn Lords? So, opens with a cracking track um, uh, in, in the triplet, da 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 uses on this and I think Satriani uses this and it's a good um, uh, lesson uh, for people writing instrumentals. What they do um, is they'll do a verse and a chorus, a verse bridge chorus. If it's if it's short, they'll do a verse chorus, verse chorus and get the solo in the middle quickly. But if they've got a kind of longer verse bridge chorus arrangement, often they'll just do verse bridge chorus and then go to the middle solo. And that stops it getting too repetitive and it cuts the arrangement time down. And just off the top of my head, I can't remember the arrangement on this one. But that's why the songs are, are kind of tight. He's, you know, once he gets the kind of one minute 30 mark, then he'll put his middle solo in and then he'll spin back out into the chorus of the main theme. Uh, and like I say, if you don't do that on these kind of songs, you end up repeating a verse of chorus uh, and the song starts going over four minutes and you're repeating ideas. You're going to play a lot of notes and run out of ideas. Very hard to write good instrumentals. Um, it's a great solo on this. He trades off with himself um, on a on the keyboard. Um, it's a great solo, and he's using like really excessive whammy vibrato, which is one of his trademarks. He works really good. So that's the first track. It's great. The next track, full on uh, fast uh, double kick drum metal, hundreds of thousands, and phenomenal drumming by Dean Castronova on this. Um, Tony absolutely shreds his. Uh, but off, uh, I think the end of the solo is an incredible fast run. Uh, again, he's got that aggression. He's got that thing where he's almost speeding up in the middle of the run, uh, which is really cool. The other great thing about McAlpine on this and on his uh, other stuff around his time, he uses pinch harmonics, and that kind of because he's a big George Lynch fan, that kind of differentiated him from say Vinnie Moore or Malmsteen or players who didn't have that sort of little bit of LA in the playing. So really cool. Track three is probably the the I'd say one of the most popular tracks off the album, Tears of Sahara. So it's a lovely B minor power ballad. This builds really well. Again, it it basically plays over the clean with the melody and the chorus. Then the second verse and this short verse chorus power chords come in, builds it up, and then you're into the solo and he trades off with his hero George Lynch here. Um, so Lynch does a phenomenal job here of um, basically sitting in with McAlpine and playing, being a counterpoint to McAlpine's style. So Lynch does some lovely sort of blues based in the pocket playing and gets some beautiful phrasing. Uh, and then McAlpine, his soul is kind of whammy slurring as a different take. Then Lynch does a cool kind of fast run coming in for his next solo. 
and then Calpine did some amazing arpeggios. Um, it's a great track. It's got a really majestic melody. Um, it's one of the best, you know, guitar shred instrumentals ever written, I think. Then you've got Key to the City. Funnily enough, you can actually find a video for this, an obscure video, promo video of this online. I read it before this album made number 146 on the Billboard charts. Not that high, but it stayed in 11 weeks, so pretty good sales for something like this. Um, you know, these arms are typically selling about 100,000 worldwide, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you put that in YouTube streaming, Spotify streaming terms, you know, uh, 1,500 plays is one album sale. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you, your streaming figure on that would be about 15 million, I think. Um, is it more than that? Add the zeros on. I've probably miscalculated that, but anyway. This, Keep the City's great track. Um, uh, lovely melody, lovely solo in the middle of this, a lovely two-handed tapping bit. Um, again, McAlpine just crafts really good melodies that are kind of, uh, how do you put it, they sort of got a, a euphoric quality to them. Uh, they're quite majestic, kind of a bit symphonic, I suppose. And then side one of the original vinyl, finish with the time and the test. So this tries to outdo hundreds of thousands and probably succeeds. It's even faster double kick drums. Amazing from Dean Castanova. Um, I think this is under three minutes. Um, uh, Tony does a phenomenal solo in the middle with some amazing high harmonic whammy bar dives. And then the arpeggio section at the end is just incendiary. So, you know, uh, it's as good a side one of any kind of album, really, whether it's got vocals or not. Side two opens with the King's Cup. Uh, again, another kind of a da 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 da, -da type of feel. Um, trades off with Jeff Watson on this. Quite interesting that Jeff Watson appeared on this because obviously he's in Night Range, which is an AOR hard rock band. But at this time, Jeff Watson was meeting other players and stretching out. He'd become friends with Alan Holdsworth, or certainly after this, he became friends with Holdsworth. And um, he gets to cut loose with his eight finger tapping. Uh, and again, Tony does a really interesting sort of counterpoint to him. So, you know, he does some nice whammy, melodic whammy slurring. And he does a cool arpeggio passage on his second solo. It's a great track. Then one of my favourite tracks, Sacred Wonder, mentioned about the rhythm guitar. So it changes groove and tempo. This has got a really grinding tempo. Got one of the best solos on the album, maybe the best. Like, Bill's really good. And then just does some phenomenal shredding. Love it. And a brilliant, majestic melody for the chorus. Then, in typical McAlpine fashion, he has a Chopin etude. Etude number four, opus ten. Um, it's amazing he can do this. I'm not fussed about having them on the album. But then again, it's quite interesting when you get to the end of this two-minute piece because they're blasting the vision. And this is kind of a welcome sort of return to some like really heavy riffing. Uh, again, not the tempo of hundreds of thousands of all the time of the test, but it fairly motors. He trades off with Lynch again. Um, although it's not a spectacular solo uh, as Tiz and Hara, there's still some really cool stuff. It's a great track. Uh, and then you've got Dream State, uh, again, a bit like Keep the City, sort of a, a kind of ethereal melody, suiting the title. Um, not the best track on it, but it, it's still a really good track. And then he does Porcelain Doll, which is an arrangement of a, show, is it a Chopin melody, I think. You know, I can't read. Um, I think it is an arrangement of a Chopin melody. Quite weird, the timing on this is a weird f f three, four f feel, I think. Um, I just think... Actually, it's 6 8, I think. Don't quote me. Um, uh, there's a bit where the drums feel a bit out of time, actually, but it's a really nice melody. And then he does a really cool solo that kind of has really interesting modulations and builds up. Um, so I suppose it's fair to say, I think that the album probably tails off once you get past Sacred Wonder, uh, once you get the Chopin uh, piano thing. The tracks after that aren't as strong as the ones before, but your first seven tracks are just awesome. Uh, and your, your last three tracks are really good. Um, so for me, it's, you know, it's a nine out of ten. Um, it's still like the instrumental album I enjoy listening to more than any other. I can just listen to every track uh, and just uh, get into it. Um, like I say, it'd be, with hindsight, it'd be better if there was kind of less effect on the guitar, but that was kind of Tony's style. Um, uh, but I just think he had a writing style and a, a way of creating the songs that although you could argue other players might be better or you might prefer aspects of other players, I think his package that he put together on albums was really, really good. Um, after this, he did a vocal album, uh, Eyes of the World and McAlpine Project, which I quite like. It's kind of AOR hard rock. And then he kind of went back to instrumental stuff, but he, he never really had the budget or the songs as much to me. 
Um, I think, like I said before, I think writing instrumental guitar music, it's one thing to do one or two albums, but when you, you're just doing that, it's just how many notes, how many ideas can you play? Um, you know, so I think it's easy for guitarists to uh, maybe not dry up, you know, there'd still be some really good tracks on the album, but to create a consistent album. Uh, later on in the year, I'll look at Saturday Only Surfing with the Alien. I think that's a case in point where you've got real consistency. Okay, so uh, probably, like I say, came out in the summer, but coming up to 35 years old, there's a weird cover. Obviously, it's back to front. Very strange cover for that. Um, but um, but just finally, actually, I'll just tell you, on the back of the album, McAlpine had a BC Rich guitar with like a crackle finish. And I, when I first came, uh, I came up to Newcastle in the north of England to study music, and there was a guitar shop in town called Guitar Express, which is no longer you, no longer around. Um, but that had a crackle finish, BC Rich in it. Um, uh, I don't know who bought it, but anyway, quite rare over uh, in England at the time. Anyway, just a, a little fact there. So see you again soon, and that's uh, that's the last of the shrapnel ones for the time being. Um, they'll make a return. Uh, at some point next year. Cheers, thanks very much.